We have some more really exciting stem cell therapies to talk about today. And this next one is something uh, I, I, I found almost hard to believe. We're going to hear about another example about how human cells may be able to transform and perform remarkable feats of healing. I want you to watch a video here to watch what stem cells have been able to do against diseases that have proven stubbornly resistant to interventions with pharmaceuticals. Please watch. It was a fairly uneventful pregnancy for the Rooney family. Their first child, Patrick, was born near full term by cesarean section and all seemed well for a while. So your left hand would be like a fist and hold the bottle to his mouth. And then when he was crawling, we thought it was cute, but his right, right leg did all the work, like, and the left leg just dragged. It was cerebral palsy, and it didn't get better when Patrick started walking. His left leg would turn in, and um, when he started walking, he walked a little later, and he would fall a lot. And then when he started running, he would trip over his left leg. Today, you wouldn't know that 12-year-old Patrick had ever had any brain issues. The change started six years ago with a letter the Long Island family got from Viacord, the company where Patrick's umbilical cord blood cells had been banked. It asked if they wanted to volunteer for a groundbreaking study at Duke University with Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg. Patrick would have an infusion of his own stem cells from his cord blood and then followed for a year. The remarkable results of the placebo-controlled double-blind study are documented in a just-published journal. We were able to look at the motor tracks, um, which are the nerve connections that control motor function, and we were able to show that children who had improvement in function also had uh, either repair or development of new motor tracks in the area of their deficit. Now Patrick has no problem keeping up with his younger brothers. And that left hand that used to curl into a fist, no problem. And even sports. And swimming. Mm -hmm. And uh, basketball. And, and baseball. Please welcome Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg to tell us more about this remarkable therapy, not just for cerebral palsy, but also for autism. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're using cord blood and cord tissue as therapeutic cells to treat children with cerebral palsy and um, autism. And I have to just say a couple of words about how this whole story started. Back in 1988, there was a little boy with Fanconi anemia who needed a transplant and got one from his baby sister's cord blood. And that was the first demonstration that cord blood actually had blood stem cells that could reconstitute bone marrow in a transplant. And you can see on the right, um, 30 years later, he is healthy, he's taller than me, and most importantly, his bone marrow is uh, comprised of his baby sister's cord blood cells. So his transplant, first in man, first in a child, paved the way for the whole field of cord blood transplantation. Um, now at Duke, in addition to doing regular transplants in kids with leukemia and genetic diseases, we barked, embarked upon a program using cord blood therapies without transplant in patients with um, a lot of different diseases that affect the brain. And here we're infusing cells, either from the patient themselves or from a donor, um, without any preparative regimen or immunosuppression. And we don't think the cells are engrafting. We think the cells are acting through what's called paracrine signaling. Um, now, people say that cord blood is a bag of stem cells, um, but it isn't. Cord blood has maybe 0.001% of the cells being blood stem cells on the top. Um, and then the cells that are circled on the bottom are the cells that we think are operative in helping children with problems of the brain. And the monocyte or the CD14 cell, when it's fresh, can act um, in a favorable way in hypoxic injury. And when it's cultured and manufactured, can actually induce remyelination in the brain. Um, so this is a picture of a, what's called an organotypic model, which is a model of mouse brain slices in the brain that we make to study how cord blood cells can mediate brain repair after hypoxic damage. And on the left, you can see healthy brain with green neurons. In the middle, you can see damaged brain after hypoxic insult. And all the pink is astrocytes or scarring. And the green cells that are in the neurons are gone. And then over on the right, you can see 
that when we add cord blood CD14 cells to the culture after the injury, the neurons are rescued and they survive and the brain tissue looks normal. And we used experiments like this to justify clinical trials, um, which we are performing in children with brain um, insults after birth uh, in cerebral palsy and in autism. And I'll just mention that all of these studies are under INDs from the FDA, approved by our hospital IRB, and um, they're funded through various foundations, including the Marcus Foundation, so that the children coming for treatment and their families are not paying for the therapy that they're getting on these clinical trials. So we recently published results of uh, a study we've done in children with cerebral palsy, which was randomized, uh, treated 63 young children ages one to six um, who had their own cord blood unit available for infusion. And the study was designed like this picture. So they got qualified, their cord blood was qualified. They came to Duke, they were confirmed to be eligible for the study by neurologists in our program. They were randomized and they either received a cord blood infusion or a placebo infusion. And the placebo was tissue culture media that was pink with something called DMSO, which is the cryopreservative that are in frozen cells. So every child got pink stuff that's made them smell on their breath, whether it was really cord blood or it was the placebo. And they also got a lot of tests done by physical therapists and neurologists and MRIs. They went home, came back a year later, crossed over, and got what they didn't get the first time. So, um, and they were blinded, as the testers were, to the order of their treatment, and they came back one more year later for evaluation. Um, and we assessed them on something called a GMFM scale, which is a validated scale for motor function in kids with CP, and it's rated by their age and how much disability they have at the age they come on the study. And these scores predict the natural history of motor development in kids without treatment. And then we compared that to what a child would be um, scored as a positive result in the blue dots um, after treatment. So a child had to have 30% more improvement than would have been predicted by this scale to say that the cord blood cells made a difference. And um, this shows you the results of the study. The children who got um, in red placebo or the low dose um, did not improve above the scale, but the children in blue who got an appropriate dose of cord blood cells, which happens to be 25 million cells per kilo, improved. And in the pictures you see below, that was associated with increased and new tracks in the brain in the motor system. So the red lines mean there were new tracks, and the blue dots, the turquoise dots, mean the nodes or the hubs of those tracks were also increased. So we saw improvement in kids that were dosed appropriately, and we saw increased brain connectivity in those children. Um, and all of these kids had these scans under anesthesia. Each scan was done three times. They each uh, have four terabytes of data. So they were, this kind of analysis is done on supercomputers. Um, so let me show you some examples. Wow, we got them yes. This is a very That's severe so child. He can only lift his head at 19 months of age. That's all he can do. Uh, this is this child a year later, uh, after Did treatment. Did you say yes or no? And he's not normal, but the fact that he can stand and he can point means that his functional level is much more than it would have been. And this is very important for his quality of life and his future abilities. Now here's another child um, coming on this study uh, with spasticity in his legs, so he's wearing braces, he crosses his legs, that's called scissoring, and he can only walk with the walker. Um, and this child, a year later, shown here. Wow, nice So this is more than would have been expected for the natural history of the wow. development of new motor function in a child with this level of CP. And every child on our study was filmed and every film was assessed um, independently. 
So now, in cerebral palsy, because that was using children's own cells, we're moving into using donor cells, because quite frankly, many children with CP are premature or born after complicated deliveries. The cord blood can't be collected. And if, if this is working, it, we need to provide access to all children. So again, in a phase two study, we're testing allogeneic or publicly banked cord blood and MSCs that we manufacture in our program. And ultimately, we will take one or both of those into phase three for approvals uh, if they work. Um, in autism, we finished a phase one trial testing safety and feasibility of these cells. And I have to tell you, it's very different treating an autistic child. They don't want to be in the hospital. They don't want to be monitored. They don't want an IV. They want to be out of there. So we really had to develop different ways to approach them and different methods to test them. And so for the infusions, they were actually sedated. They got the MRI. They got the IV. They got the infusion. They woke up. They could leave. And for the testing, they went to a place that did not look like a hospital run by my colleague, Jerry Dawson, who is the autism expert at Duke, um, where they were tested in a setting that was much more comfortable uh, for their uh, performance. We also, uh, and they also had placebo infusion? So this is a phase one open label, okay. straight. Um, and in this study, we weren't trying to prove efficacy. We were trying to look and see if it's safe and if we could identify endpoints to test in a phase two trial. We did. The main endpoint is something called the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. And you can see in the picture that the kids um, in the middle um, where the line goes up did improve at six months. Um, and when we looked at whether that was related to their cognitive function, the kids in the red bar had higher median IQs, so that's a median IQ of 70 or above, which is still low, but typical for an autistic child, and they had the most improvement. So we took all this into a phase two study, but I'll show you just a couple of videos of one little boy on the phase one. Um, so if we can start this, um, you'll see this is a test where he should name pictures. We're going to look verbal. at some pictures. I need you to tell me what they are, OK? Here, my turn. Oh, thank you. What is that? What is that? So he doesn't talk, and he doesn't really make eye contact. That's um, a he's dog? typical dog? of an autistic child of this age. And if you look at him at his next testing, which is a year later, and we start this hey. video. Ready? Yes. <gasps> what is that? It's a banana. Oh, a banana. Cooper, each of this stuff. What is that? It's an airplane. It's why it goes. It goes down, 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 it goes. Yeah. That's an airplane. It goes. So he's talking, he's making eye contact, he's imaginative, his scores improve. And this was the kind of improvement we saw. And this enabled us to go, oh, here, sorry, here he is, even um, six months after that, just skiing down a mountain, <laughs> not bad. But that enabled us to go into a phase two randomized placebo-controlled crossover study, which is ongoing now with 178 kids enrolled. And this study will tell us if cells work or not, and within the cell group, if the child's own cells versus donor cells have a difference. And this study will be finished um, next fall, so fall of 2018, and will be very pivotal to determine what direction we take. If it's positive and shows that donor cells and the child's own cells work equally, then we'll be able to go into the donor cell arena um, and provide this therapy to more children, and we'll take it into phase three. So I'll just end by saying that we're also looking at other sources of cells, cord tissue MSCs. So this is made from the umbilical cord itself. And we are making this from C-section births where the mom has given us permission to donate her baby's cord and do the manufacturing. And we take it into our lab, and we cut it in pieces and digest it, and we can make it into multiple doses. If you see those bags on the bottom left, each one of those is a dose for a child. And from one manufacturing run, we can get about 5 billion cells, which is about 200 doses for children that we're treating. 
Um, and we've been able to show that uh, these cells suppress microglial activation. So microglia are the cells that we think are irritated in the brain of children with autism. And we require that every manufacturing lot we make suppress microglia. So in the middle, they're activated. And on the right, they calm down after the addition of affected, effective sorry, MSCs. Um, and we finished a study where we tested one, two, or three doses in a phase one open-label trial recently, and we're about to go into phase two this summer. Um, so um, we really think cord blood therapies are promising. We've shown safety of the donor cells. We're doing clinical trials to look at efficacy of the donor cells. Um, it's unclear for your own cells what the pathway forward for regulatory approval is going to be. And I'll just end by saying we opened an expanded access protocol, which um, we've had an outpouring of more children than I can possibly tell you we can handle. I have 17,000 emails in my inbox from families looking for help, and that's without ever telling anyone who I am. So um, these are twin. Oops, go back. <laughs> these are um, twins. This is supposed to say thanks. Um, one has hydrocephalus. You can see he has a bigger head on the left, and the other donated his cord blood to treat that baby's hydrocephalus. So there are a lot of good things that can be done with this therapy, but we still have a lot to learn. So thank you. So. Joanne, we don't have much time, but let me, uh, a couple of little quick things. So if, if using these um, uh, placental or cord blood that, that you talked about in processing them, that will then enable you to have enough cells to, assuming regulatory approval, to treat many or most of these 17,000. The demand, obviously, is going to be massive, yeah, we and we need enough cells. Well, there's plenty of cells. It's not a source issue as long as we can use donor cells. Yeah. So then who are the right candidates here? Does it depend on, on age, uh, when, when you treat them, uh, the severity of their, uh, of their symptoms and so forth? How do you mm -hmm. decide? So we need, we need to do more trials. So our trials have really focused on very young children. And there we can't see an age effect, but it may be that we haven't looked at a wide enough age range. So we hope in our next series of studies to look at older children with autism, young adults with autism, wow. and older children with CP. And this seems to be a durable effect. Yeah. In other yes. words, you don't have to keep infusing or it, it doesn't seem to wear off. So, with, so it does not wear off. But with the children with CP, they build on, once they have more function, they build on having more function. With the children with autism, I can't prove it, but I think we're gonna wanna give them multiple doses, and that's why the MSCs have a lot of value, because we can make multiple doses from the same donor. Terrific. Dr. Joanne Kirchberg, thank you very much. Very exciting. <laughs>